Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome to today's home games. Um, we've got a great session for you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I'll talk you through who the panel are. Um, so the topic is regulation. And um, as with all of these things, I've picked a massive topic to cover in, in the very short space of 45 minutes. But hopefully my panel here are going to kind of help me through all of that and guide me through. Um, so I think most people um, who I can see are on the call um, know most people but um i'll kind of just do the rounds down my windows um so we have uh dennis hall from yellowtail financial planning uh, we have my colleague mike barrett from the Langcat. uh we have uh, michael ruck who's a partner at knl gates a law firm and then to complete our regulatory lawyer panel we have philip Ann, who's from clark wilmot uh so they'll be kind of taking us through some some big t uh sort of issues around one kind of regulations and the rules piece that kind of govern financial services but also i guess the regulator itself and perhaps maybe how the fca has changed over time and whether that's been for the better or, or for the worse really so um we'd love for you to ask your questions as you do with these things to chat away down the side um you can put your comments and your questions in there um for the panel um and then there's also an ask a question button down the bottom which i think you all are familiar with by now but that will kind of ask a question away from the main chat and bring something up on my screen so that i can kind of pull that into the conversation seamlessly. Um, and then the only other thing to say, and I got told off for not telling you it last time, is that if you do have any audio, video kind of technical problems, um, there may be nothing we can do about it, but there may be something we can do about it. So if you give that link um, a click, that should just reset things and I don't know, rebuffer or something. I don't know, it should do some magic and that should kind of reset your feed so that everything works as it should. So I think that's about it from me in terms of housekeeping and preamble. So I'll probably just launch into the chat. Um, and ahead of this kind of um, conversation, I was just sort of like looking at um, what the FCA's objectives actually were, just to remind myself what they actually were. And it was around protecting consumers, enhancing market integrity and promoting competition. So I guess I'd be interested to hear from the panel as to whether you feel like the FCA is delivering on any or all of those fronts, and in particular, I suppose, on the consumer protection piece. Um, so I might pick on um, Dennis, actually, to start us <laughs> off with that one. <laughs> what Probably. do you think about the kind of consumer protection piece, especially? Do you think that is something the FCA is, is being effective on or not? I think it's a work in progress. Um, uh, there are areas where they've been effective, but large areas, I think, where they have been very ineffective or very late to the party, or in fact created so many obstacles, it's difficult for consumers even to get access to advice. Mm -hmm. um, so it, yeah, it, it, a mixed bag of results there, but mostly negative from me. Yeah, and, and Kate is sort of saying she can feel her blood pressure rising already. I do actually feel that, especially when I was at Money Marketing and talking to people at Regulation, I just felt that my job was just to ring around and wind people up. So that's not what I'm trying to do here today, uh, but um, we'll, we'll see how we go. And then, Dennis, so just on that then, uh, do you feel like some of that has come from the fact that maybe the FCA doesn't act on the intelligence it receives? Um, or, or where do you think the problem lies? Well, I think as a as a user, you get that impression. And as somebody who's gone to the regulator with intelligence, you know, things that are happening, and you don't get anything back, it's like this sponge, it takes a lot of information in, but you have no idea what they're doing with it. And as somebody who fills out regulatory returns every half year, and I have no idea what they're doing with that uh, information, because it doesn't seem to impact me. I don't get asked any questions about it. Um, and I don't see that they're really stepping up and and walking into people's offices and saying, we're seeing things here that we're not expecting to see or we, we wouldn't want to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. they, they're just not doing that. There are, I think what I would expect from a regulator is what I'd expect from the community, Bobby, is that somebody's on the beat and actually knocking on a door from time to time, finding out what's going on. And it doesn't happen. This is all about empire building for me. Mm, mm. Okay, and um, thank you for that. And then so um, Philippa and Michael, then I mean, you're dealing with the regulator 
at the kind of sharp end when things are going wrong. And um, Michael, we might talk about it later, but um, you've done some time <laughs> without making it sound like you're a prisoner at the FCA as well. So you've got an interesting perspective on that. Yeah, regulatory experience, I probably should have framed it as. Um, so but it'd be good to hear from you in terms of whether you think the FCA is doing a good job and areas maybe where it's working well and less well. I don't know, Philippa, shall I start with you on that one? Yeah, so I suppose I should preface this by saying I see it when it goes wrong. And so all the all the documents, all the clients I see are when it's gone horribly wrong. And so my, my perspective may be slightly um, skewed by the fact that that's where I sit, albeit that I know lots of very, very good financial advisors. I have a very good financial advisor and I know what a difference financial advisors make to their clients' lives. So actually, I think it is it is a few rogues in amongst some very, very good people. Uh, but that said, in terms of consumer protection, uh, uh, there are frustrations that I have around what the FCA has and hasn't done. I mean, people will know that I've been heavily, heavily involved in the British Steel um, stuff that's going on. But when you look at the money which is paid out by the FSCS, it's £530 million last year. That is not a success story. I mean, it's a success story in so far as there is an FSCS and clients are getting some form of compensation. But I know I've wanged on about this a lot, but it, there is, the solicitors, um, the SRA compensation scheme had to pay out £12 million last year. When you compare those two, those two numbers, one is dwarfed by the other for the simple reason that solicitors are insured for past business in a way that... Um, financial advisors through no fault of their own, through the fault, frankly, of the FCA, uh, are left with a potential hole in the business that they are that they are that they are running. Um, and so I think when we talk about consumer protection, there is a huge hole where PI insurance should be. Mm -hmm. OK, well, I'm pretty sure we'll probably come back to that in a bit more detail. But thank you for that. Um, and Michael, from from your perspective, do you think, do you get a sense of, um, it might be good maybe if you start off with kind of what your role is and kind of maybe what you've done in the past, but um, do you get a sense of um, whether regulation and the regulator has changed over time? Yeah, I think it's definitely changed. I mean, I joined what was the FSA back in 2008 and its enforcement division was there till the end of 2013 to sort of transition through to the FCA as well. So, I mean... <laughs> There was some change during that period in terms of how they operated, but I think having been through that, uh, there was also, I, I, I think, uh, it's hopefully not casting aspersions, but there was also a bit of kind of, well, we're changing the, the kind of name on the door and the names on various doors, but in terms of the actual process and the regulations and how we approach it, I'm not sure I saw a dramatic change or, or the dramatic change that was kind of being forewarned or, or pushed for by the FSA and FCA. And then I think what we've probably seen thereafter, so I mean, I'm now working in private practice, a bit like Philip, helping firms and individuals when it's generally gone a bit wrong or, or something's gone a bit wrong or the FCA think it's gone a bit wrong, whether or not it has or, or hasn't. Um, and I think from that perspective, what we've seen is, is really, I think they've got, let's be honest, the FCA have got some really good people but they've also got a lack of understanding a lot of the time around certain markets, around certain kind of products, around certain processes, things that we've seen recently around consumer credit coming in, around crypto and all this kind of stuff that I'm not sure they've really got to grips with their understanding of. And that may be a lack of resource. I think it's part of it. I think part of it's probably a lack of or kind of potentially negative morale at the moment as well. We're all seeing stuff around strikes and all this kind of thing. And I think they're finding it very difficult to kind of progress in the way that they want to. And Philip has mentioned kind of FSCS, yes, and it's something that I think we spoke about the other day, is that where you've got, kind of comes back to this consumer protection point, where you've got the FCA trying to kind of put in consumer protection. But you've got consumers kind of being lost, and I think Mike's going to talk a bit later on around some of this, around kind of the FCA potentially don't really look after consumers that well, but they also get sometimes get a bit lost between the FSCS, the FOS, and that kind of thing. So I think that they're facing quite a few challenges at the moment, and it's it's surprising, I think, given the, I suppose, political focus and the political push 
for financial services and given everything post Brexit, that they almost don't have the resource they need and the people that they need to be able to mm. kind of do it successfully. Okay. I mean, how many vacancies have they got at the moment? Is it 750 vacancies? Loads and loads. I mean, I, I know, for example, they've taken a huge number of people into the, the authorisations division because that was always a point, wasn't it? To kind of authorisation change and control just used to take ages. And they've hired a whole bunch of people. I'm not sure it's actually got any quicker. Mm. Yeah. And um, Mike, I'll bring you in here. Thank you for waiting patiently. So did you want to come back on on any of that? Uh, or do you kind of uh, want to call out specific areas that are working well or less well in the regulatory framework? Yeah, I, I think I definitely agree with, with, I think, where Dennis was hinting that even if you can find stuff that is working well now, it, it's an area of, it has to be an area of continuous improvement. And as Michael said, the, the the environment has changed dramatically over the last few years with with some of the stuff around crypto and the things which are happening on the regulatory perimeter. I mean, I think I think generally, again, to kind of put things into context, uh, like like Philippa did, the the two kind of context things I I always try to remind myself when we when we talk about the regulator is that firstly they they regulate the entire population, and I know from past work with clients we've we've done some kind of segmentation exercises and you realize just how few of the population go into this world of of financial services and that the regulator is responsible for looking after people who for, for example the cost of living crisis is really seriously going to bite and they're and as much as you tell oh yeah get them a financial plan or what have you there's an element of the population who have done that and simply don't have enough money and are exposed to all of the scams and all of this, the, the, the desperation that people in that, that segment must live. And yeah, they, they, I think you could probably argue they should be looking after that group of people probably more than actually somebody who's, who's accumulated a reasonable amount of wealth and is working with a, with a financial advisor. And yeah, secondly, within the context, they, again, they regulate more than just financial advisors. So, I mean, we, we've, we kind of, we're inevitably going to fall into that trap as, as part of this conversation. But within the financial advisor world, I just think they're, they're reasonably confused about financial advisors. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of kind of good practice and the good, good outcomes that that they see there and actually as i said in context to some of the other stuff that's happening at the wider population level how concerned are they about a wealthy person who's paying i don't know 0.5 more, more on an advice charge than perhaps they could do i don't think the impact of that relative to some of the other stuff that's out there i think they prioritize around all of that and yeah they they when they do go and see advisors when they've done suitability studies um those who have found probably okay in the main apart from some of the stuff which um which which philippa and michael get heavily involved in so there's this kind of as i said this this kind of confusion around what what is going on i mean i think the other thing i'd say in, in our kind of world of platforms and advisors which we we tend to hang around in at the at the, at the Lancat, there's been a lot of kind of looking at stuff and chin stroking and thinking about stuff and market studies and um I was, I'm, I'm going to quote The Wire, which is a brilliant way to go on a, on a webinar, but there's, <laughs> there's a line in there of, of, yeah, just do it or don't, which admittedly is when someone's about to get murdered, potentially, But it, so we're not quite at that level. But yeah, just do, Thank goodness, yeah. do the work or don't. Don't talk, do a platform market study and highlight loads of issues and then put something out last week saying, oh, yeah, those issues are still there. We might do something about it soon talk about exit fees put that through a platform market study hint about it in consumer duty yeah do it or don't um, mm. and if you don't want to do it and want to prioritize a higher priority then great get on and do it just yeah be clear what you want to do yeah okay yeah and i probably should have said at the top that i did ask the fca to come on this call and uh and they did say no the hell of a <laughs> <laughs> um and i don't know whether that was because my reputation preceded me or what but but <laughs> as we kind of launch into what might end up being an fca bashing session i did try and give them the right of reply i just want to put that out there so so that that's all cool thank you for that and one of the things i wanted to get um all your views on really was about sort of whether there's enough accountability in the system or not um 
And and Michael, I think when we spoke um, uh, a few days ago, we talked about the senior managers um, and certification regime. And obviously that was one of these big regulatory projects where there was a lot of kind of hoo-ha and supporting work that firms had to do. And all of that was about driving individual accountability. Uh, but do you think that has kind of um, come to pass or is that one of those kind of they've, people have done the work, but yet there's nothing really to show for it type things that that Mike was talking about just there? Yeah, I, th I think it's probably one of those situations isn't it, where the good firms and the firms that are keen to do well and do it properly have and they've given it a lot of thought and kind of structured it appropriately and potentially had conversations with the FCA about how they approach it, etc. Whereas the firms who aren't that interested or who aren't potentially kind of up to speed or just generally struggling kind of potentially haven't. I mean, some of the bigger firms spent vast amounts of money on projects and governance maps and, and everything else that went with it, consultants and stuff. Um, and I think that the difficulty around accountability is that I think both within kind of the regulated world and within the regulator itself, I'm not sure we've seen a lot of output in terms of kind of people, individuals being held accountable for issues. I think, I mean, I remember when the, the, the new regime came in a while ago now, 2018, and, and you could see what the aim was. So the aim was obviously to hold more, more senior individuals more accountable more often. And I got that. I think you could kind of understand why the FCA were pushing that. I think the tricky part is the way that it's, it's been both implemented and reviewed thereafter is that I'm not sure it's really dealt with the issues that existed under the approved persons regime that they are having around how do you track for example if there's an issue within a business how do you track that through a number of people to ultimately reach a senior manager and get to the view that they should have known about it or did know and didn't do something about it there's often a break somewhere in that chain intentionally or otherwise and I think that causes them real difficulties in, in holding individuals accountable. And then when you look within the FCA, which is a slightly different issue, I think, I think within the FCA itself, there's some accountability around decision making and processes because they've got a huge number of internal processes around approvals and sign off, etc. But when you look at the senior individuals at the FCA in the way that you would look at them in, within the industry, do we really think they've been held accountable for various issues that may or may not take place? Dennis is shaking his head, so I'll probably possibly hand over to him at that point. Well, I, was gonna say, well, I did want to kind of ask Dennis, like, well, and I guess the whole panel really, like, um, I think Michael alluded to it earlier, but we have seen kind of headlines around, well, I'm going to lower the tone now, but crude headlines around FCA's toilet behaviour and stuff a couple of yeah. years ago. And then we've also seen now kind of the, the disquiet there is around pay structures and stuff so the impression that I get when I read all that stuff is there's actually something internally that's gone a bit awry there um so I don't know Dennis whether you wanted to kind of respond to any of that really in terms of the it regulator all feels very than dysfunctional. The regulation. It, mm. it feels very dysfunctional um I mean I haven't gone into the the new regulator but I was invited to do some work with a previous regulator and departments don't talk to each other. That's the impression that I got. Um, and they, they have incredibly rigid rules within the regulator between departments and floors. And you can't eat here, you can eat there. I mean, it, it seemed very odd, but that's something that really stuck with me is that we have a place to eat. And if you're doing work in this room around um, uh, sort of suitability reports and it's lunchtime, we're not bringing the lunch into you as sandwiches. We've got to go somewhere else. But just bring that we can work through lunch. No, you can't work through lunch. We're an organization that doesn't do that. And right. it's weird. It's a very weird place to be. Um, and also, I think the Peter principle really applies is that, you know, if you're really crap at your job, you'll get the job as the head of the Bank of England. Um, <laughs> it's that kind of it's that kind of organization, isn't it? This feels very civil servant like um, mm -hmm. yeah, you're useless. So we'll move you on somewhere better. But um, isn't, and, isn't part of the challenge here, hmm. sorry, Nat, um, that just the, the inherent structure of the advice sector. So if you look at, and I'm kind of going to make the numbers up on the spot here, so hopefully they're broadly correct, but there's something like five and a half thousand 
investment advice firms, around about 90% of those have got less than five advisors. I think about 48% have got, got one advisor. So it's such a kind of fragmented market with loads and loads and loads of very, very small firms that it's it's challenging. You're not, I, I completely understand where Dennis is coming from around having a Bobby on the beat, but when when there's that many small firms, it's, gonna, it's really, really hard to get hold of. And that's partly, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll get onto the subject of some of the AR imminent changes coming through. That's partly why I think they're focusing on some of that, those are really trying to get it at that particular level. But yeah, there's still that problem of one and two man bands, person bands, advice firms who are really, really hard to see what they're, what, what they're up to. Mm. And um, that's, yeah, thank you for that. So, yeah, we've talked a bit about the people at the regulator, but it would be good to talk about the structural element of the regulator as well. And Philippa, you were kindly a, a guest on our podcast the other day where you were talking about your concerns around that appointed representative model um, and sort of linked to that whenever the question of regulation comes up, the question of costs come up and that interplay between FCA, FSCS, PI, the whole alphabet soup type thing. So do you think, um, so perhaps if you could just outline what your concerns are around the AR model briefly, and then whether what you would suggest, what would you would like to see change, which might then re result in perhaps fairer the costs of regulation being applied to other firms? Gosh, okay. Um, <laughs> how long have I got? Uh, so, so as I said, where, where I come into this is where I see it go wrong. Mm -hmm. And so you have, there was a court case uh, a couple of years ago called Anderson versus Sense, where you had about 90 individuals who were part of a Ponzi scheme um, run by the AR of the network. Mm. And they were ripped off, pure and simple. The the AR is now um, uh, residing at Her Majesty's pleasure, having been convicted of fraud. Uh, there were tens of millions of pounds and innocent people lost their entire life savings. But they understood that the AR was authorised and regulated by the FCA because the general person on the street doesn't understand the AR regime. They mm -hmm. simply saw that they were they were on the FCA register. They had all the legal wording at the bottom of Everything the was there. Yeah, yeah, These yeah. people did nothing wrong. And um, the case went to court. And it, in, in fact, I took it over when it was in the Court of Appeal, um, or we were just waiting for the result from the Court of Appeal, and we applied up to the Supreme Court. But the nut, the, the, the upshot of it was that the court interpreted the Financial Services and Markets Act to say that the network is only responsible for the AR to the extent of the contract between those two entities. So they are not responsible for the full extent of everything that the AR does. And as the, the man on the street, how are you supposed to know what the terms of the contract is between the AR and the network? Well, you go to your AR, which you think is simply a financial advisor, and mm. they are, um, and they're advising you on something that they don't have a contractual right to advise on, you're not insured. There is nothing there to respond to you. And the average Joe on the street does not understand that. So I don't, I don't think the AR regime works. I think it is too open to people um, using it for Machiavellian purposes. And we have seen that time and time again. That case is not the only case where there have been problems with, with ARs. And there is also an, a misunderstanding as to exactly how insurance is applied between the AR and, okay. the, and the network. So I, I think that system is broken and you don't see that system in other professions. And I think there is a case for looking at all the professions and saying, well, what works? What works for solicitors? What works for accountants? Hmm. What, um, what works for architects? And what doesn't work? And how do we create a system where we're not reinventing the wheel all the time, where people are actually genuinely protected? Because everybody can act access information online now. So we need to give them the ability to see where somebody is really good. And, and, and what we fail to do within the financial services industry is identify the really good people as well as identify the bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, Kate says here, 
it's a great way to hide people. So you've kind of got that extra layer there and therefore there isn't that transparency and kind of accountability, I guess, to the point before. Um, so yeah, the second part of my question was regulatory cost, costs, which is a bit too big to tackle as part of that thing. But um, it does seem to be an endless loop where firms are concerned around rising regulatory costs. So was there anything that can change that can break that endless loop, if you like? What do people think on that? I mean, if I can jump in on the FSCS costs, um, I mean, they are only going one way. Mm. And I've seen the consultation on reducing the amount of the, the types of claims that the consumer can make. And it just makes me really angry that the easiest way to cut costs is to cut the compensation rather than deal with the root cause of it. Um, and we, we need to get the insurance provision right within financial services. This is a very strange and odd situation which has been created by the regulator because there isn't comprehensive insurance across the board. If there were, there would not be the FSCS levies because it would be caught by insurance and the insurers would have a would have skin in the game and would help to regulate the markets as they do for other professions. Mm. Michael, Michael, what do you think about, about that whole sort of dynamic? Um, it's an interesting one. I, I think we I think from the FSCS I think almost inevitably the limits and things are going to have to increase and they're, they're going to have to go up in, in terms of kind of coverage and stuff because of the position that, that we're in as Philippa points out. I think there's, there's an element as well that I think insurance, I agree with Philippa that I think insurance plays a big part here and can kind of step in. I think the tricky part with that is where, for example, there may be fraud committed by an entity or individuals and the insurer may well turn around and say, actually, we don't insure for fraud, don't we know? So that's nothing to do with regulators. So they, they kind of find themselves again having to go back to the FSCS or kind of getting lost in that gap. And um, I think that's 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 a tricky one. I think, Philip, what do you, in, in terms of kind of the, the network and the AR model, I, what do you think in terms of kind of the actual principle and whether or not they're properly monitoring the, AR, the ARs as well? I, I think there's, from my perspective, there's been a bit of a gap there. So, so let's put it nicely um around kind of actually kind of are they really, are the principals really doing what they were meant to be doing within that model as well so not just the ar going off and doing something else yeah i mean obviously that's the, it comes back to that accountability point doesn't it if as a network you are going to be accountable for the actions of your ARs in the same way that an employer is responsible for the actions of their employees. So if they go off on a frolic of their own, then you're not responsible for it. But if they're doing work which it properly falls within your business remit, then you ought to be monitoring that and you ought to be responsible. And if you are accountable and if you are responsible for that, you'll do a better job because otherwise it will hurt your pocket. And and that's what it comes down, down to, in, in my opinion. I definitely see kind of a, a real contrast when I speak to some of the principals and various networks and the real large distributors. They will talk about how, yeah, I've been hauled over the coals by the FCA. I've been oh, close and continuous. They beat me up every month like they did last month. And they have that relationship with the FCA. And then you hear from someone like Dennis and yeah, I've never seen them. We've never heard them. There's nobody on the beat. So it's chalk and cheese in that respect in terms of the, the interaction they have with the regulator. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel do, that yeah. PI insurer is, is a better regulator of me than the regulator. They're my biggest single cost. It takes me more time to fill out my PI application each year than it does my regulatory returns. They are asking more questions as a result. So there's never an instance when I fill out my PI insurance that they don't come back with for with a question and want clarification. The second biggest one is then the, the FSCS levy. The actual cost of regulation is quite tiny. And I, in a way, I'd like to see that reversed. The cost of putting it right should be should be negligible because the cost of regulation is large enough to stop this behavior in its tracks. That's interesting. Um, we had a question come in just on that kind of PI piece around um, who, who would pick this up though? Who would insure at a reasonable price given the liabilities involved? Um, Philippa, do you get a sense that there is appetite to insure 
I mean, that's always the excuse. It's always the excuse to go, well, the market won't bear it, so we can't do it. That's what the FCA says. They go, oh, yeah, no, it's a really good idea, but we can't do it because no one had insurers. I just don't know that that's true. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, If you look at where the issues lie within the industry, actually, you know, talking about, and I I absolutely accept um, Mike's point that the FCA isn't just regulating financial advisors, but if you take financial advisors and you look at the claims made through the FOS, actually, it's a tiny proportion. You know, financial advisors are doing a really good job. Um, so in, in terms of insuring financial advisors, actually, if you look at the, the data that's available to us through the Financial Ombudsman Service, there aren't a huge amount of claims being made. You do have the bigger claims in relation to the, the, um, the DB transfers because of the capacity of DB transfers to cause ca- catastrophic losses. But I, I don't think it's acceptable to simply say, oh, well, the insurers won't do it, so let's not bother. I think we absolutely need to take it further and see which insurers would be willing to do it. And actually, if there were a a statutory change to the minimum terms of insurance would they really step away from that market I mean it's easy to say don't do it otherwise I'll walk away and to Mm -hmm. hold a gun to the FCA's head I'm not convinced they actually would and if some of them did that's okay isn't it and and Paul kind of um, just followed up on that and said For him, it's about kind of making firms hold more capital so that they have that skin in the game to meet the claims. And he feels that that should be part of the solution. So the proper capital capital piece. Proper capital, not saying, well, that that connected firm over there owes me a debt of 50 grand and therefore that's my capital adequacy. It's just nonsense. It's nonsense. (laughs) Do firms say that? Yes. Wow. Okay. Interesting to know. about it. Right. Thank you for that. Um, so so that was kind of our, I guess, our rear view mirror kind of discussion. It would be good to kind of look at kind of what's coming down the track in terms of the things that people need to be paying attention to from a regulatory perspective. So this is um, the part where Mike beats the drum about consumer duty, I think. So I think this is one that he's kind of been wheeled out to talk about a lot. But um, from your point of view, Mike, what do you think what would you like to see from the FCA in terms of helping firms actually get ready for consumer duty? I, I think the biggest thing that needs to happen, and it's not just consumer duty, but this impacts is there almost needs to be a kind of a, a step change in, in the way they communicate. So they would specifically around consumer duty. Um, I think everyone's pretty clear on what the rules are going to look like or you certainly certainly are if you've read the the consultation papers i think just the mere fact of the the aggressive time scale around this indicates that they're, they're not up for a lot of debate around around all of this so what two or three months between the consultation closing and the final rule is coming out uh, next month yeah there ain't, there ain't going to be a lot of change around all of this but you look, I mean, you look at some of the stuff that came out last week, I think it was 5% of advisors weren't even aware of, of consumer duty. Um, so there's, there's definitely, a, as I said, there's a, there's a communication challenge, which, which is out there. I think, I mean, as I said, if that goes broader than just consumer duty, I think if you, if you take it back to kind of the two audiences, the advisors and the wider population we talked about earlier, I think the challenge for advisors, there's kind of a... A kind of a good and poor practice stuff which is buried deep down in some of the consultation so not just kind of the the stick of oh you've got to do this because these are rules and something's going to happen if you don't there's a lot of it is kind of good practice sensible business management and you're going to see a better business as a result of it clearer definitions of propositions which allows you to start doing kind of process management and picking away at some of the Um, the pain points we're doing a load of work on system integrations at the moment you can start to kind of deal with those types of things as well and firms who have gone through this process of really being bulletproof on things like prod we've seen a fringe benefit spin-off benefits of actually getting a a better customer proposition and certainly reducing the delivery of of that that advice proposition as well so there's loads of good examples which i think they need to draw into it i think for the for the consumers, for the for, for people on the street. Um, I mean, there's a specific thing where 
the the FCA directory is an absolute disaster zone. I, I can't think of a worse website which I use on a reasonably regular basis. And again, how somebody with very little knowledge around this is supposed to navigate and all of the scam stuff which is starting to work points you in the direction of the the fca directory and go and check that this person is a real person and it's just a massive wall that hits you when 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 you get to that particular point but i, I was at a conference last week with with money alive i don't know if he, ian's on here but um someone made the point there about scammers being really really effective communicators and i'm not sure i would agree with that completely and particularly the ones that have massive typos in their text messages that they send me tends to fall down but i just think generally the way the fca communicates is really poor there isn't a consumer face of the fca for example to go and and kind of stand up on with martin lewis or on on the news or whatever and talk about this stuff and there's as i said a big change in the quality of communications I mean, what they need to do clearly is hire a financial services communication specialist firm to, to help them through this. I don't know, any of those. You know, I don't know if we you know, you know any of those around, but yeah, there's a lot of work we can do. If you can work your way through 180, 250 pages of consumer duty, there's some good stuff there. But how many people go down to that level of detail? It, it just mm. doesn't happen. Okay. Um, and Jason, kind of on the PI point, he's um, his. Um, go at solving it single-handedly so he says um, FSCS and insurers could work jointly over five years to cover claims and set up a system of no exclusions while insurers get what they need in place and then insurers would weed out the bad people through higher PI costs so that's interesting um, and Dennis um, what would you say about that in terms of FCA and communication because it does seem like sometimes that there is that kind of adversarial relationship as opposed to everybody kind of working for the common goal and all of that kind of thing? I, I think they've been more adversarial in the past. Um, I think some of the communications are a bit um, softer these days and there's a bit more regularity, but there's not a lot of depth. Um, mm -hmm. And they're not writing to me as an, an individual practice owner and understanding the size of my practice, really. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, here you are, you're a financial advisor or you're a mortgage advisor or you're a, right. an insurance broker. Here's what we think you need to know. Go away and sort it out yourself. Mm -hmm. And you left just scratching your head sometimes about, so what is consumer duty doing that treating customers fairly, which we all spent a lot of time on a few years ago. And we've, you know, we've all got this folder that sits on our bookcase that's gathering dust about treating customers fairly that nobody's bloody interested in anymore because for firms like mine and advisors, all the advisors I know are automatically treating customers fairly. They don't need process documents to, to tick boxes that they're doing it. And I think our approach to you know, consumer duty is probably going to feel the same. You're putting in place structures that I don't need because I believe I am already on top of consumer duty. Mm. Uh, Mike might say something different. <laughs> you might do. <laughs> um, but just before you come back on that, um, uh, Mike, um, so Ben Peel um, posted a comment here. He says he agrees with you that the FCA is serious about consumer duty, but sort of highlights the fact that advisors don't have to be compliant until next April. Um, so that proves your point about the time lag between consultation, guidance, implementation and enforcement. Yeah, who, whoever wrote that article on PA needs to read the bit which says we'll, they'll be checking for progress against implementation leading up to April. So it's not a you go live on that date, they want to see progress going up to it. So there you go. That's why we have an in-house regulatory expert. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Sean, hi, Sean. She, um, she says that someone told me the scammers poor spelling and grammar is on purpose to ensure that they engage with the people that don't notice. So I hadn't heard that one. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, Michael and Philippa, I just wanted to kind of uh, turn to you as we kind of um, close. So. I think at the start of this conversation, we talked about the sort of ever present kind of cost of living crisis and how that could then feed through into scams and fraud and that kind of thing. And you've you've both kind of seen things like British Steel, unfortunately, and sort of the things that have gone wrong with unsuitable advice or, you know, pension transfers or generally, yeah, kind of fraudulent practices. So do you think that given the framework we have and the rules coming down the track, 
we could see another thing like that, another big kind of scandal, either kind of within advice or something that kind of really um, leaves consumers worse off. And where do you think that would come up if, if that is the case? The sort of next danger point, if you like. I'm happy to, to jump in there and leave, leave Michael to think. Um, <laughs> What do I think? I think there is, I think we're seeing a lot of small advisors being hoovered up by big accumulator companies. Mm. And um, I think what concerns me is where those small advice firms that have been created by people, they've, they've got their culture in place and they have their processes in place, have been sold on to big accumulator companies. Those bigger accumulator companies are going to need to make money off the back of buying those and um, small changes to people's portfolios in order to add in somebody's uh, value values or whatever, or, yeah. <laughs> um, I think is something that we're all just going to have to keep a, an eye on. I think market forces where people are coming out of the industry, people are buying up, those bigger companies or the purchaser companies having to make that purchase work the and that balance. might be where the bad practice could creep in. And I'm not saying that they're brought up by rogues, not at all. Mm -mm. But there are there are economic pressures on those companies. There are targets. There are, um, you know, that profit piece is going to be really, really important. And so I, I don't necessarily think that all of the, the issues that happen are around people waking up one morning with a Machiavellian laugh and, and deciding to do bad things. It is the incremental. It is the actually I've got to pay my kids school fees. Um, this month and I've got to I've got to improve the, on the performance by x amount uh, and that's where I can see currently that there there could be problems coming down the line okay Michael is that a concern you share or, or, the, or there are the kind of areas of the market that you're kind of keeping a keen eye on just now yeah I, I agree with what Philip has said I, I think kind of on the other side of things I think we've all seen haven't we, that the people who want to engage in fraud or scams generally seem to be one step ahead they kind of come up with ideas and, and then there's FCA or whoever is trying to react to that. I think the challenge for me as well is given what's going on in the wider world and kind of cost of living, et cetera, that, that this, the desire for people to need to fill the gap in terms of financials and when they're being offered something that seems possibly too good to be true or, or whatever, they kind of, their, their barriers and kind of blocks are kind of dropped a bit because they're kind of, we, I, it's, it's more expensive to live. So if, if someone's offering me, 8%, 10%, whatever it may be, I may be more inclined to kind of pursue that than potentially I would have been six months ago, 12 months ago, probably human nature, I suppose. And I think this then ties in something that Mike said earlier on is that, that in that sense, I think we ought to be seeing more from the FCA in terms of communications and this consumer facing job that the FCA has. I mean, it, it came up with the advertisements around PPI, didn't it, with the Arnie head on a robot and this kind of thing. So there you go, whether or not you think that was good, bad or indifferent, uh, it, at least they were communicating in many ways. And I, I think we, I think they need to be giving some thought to kind of where are these scams going to come from? What are the issues that, that people are going to be seeing? And basically putting themselves out there and trying to say to people, beware of these certain things. This isn't advisors kind of misadvising, etc. This is fraud, this is scams, this is financial crime. So what, what can we kind of draw to people's attention in that regard? Mm. That ties in, doesn't it, with the whole, what are the new areas um, and the crypto stuff. Yeah. Mm. And when you look at the consultation paper and, and the proposal that the FSCS doesn't cover, you know, advice on that sort of thing, it's, I don't know, I think crypto is a real area where there is the potential for people to lose money quite mm. quickly. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's just as much the FCA as advertising standards and all the rest of it. You, you get the tube and you look at some of the horrible stuff that you see advertised there, and that's it's it's unregulated, so it's it's difficult to point the finger completely at the FCA around all of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that I think the challenge I've seen in that regard is that we kind of we represent certain firms, etc., and and I I really don't think the FCA has really got an understanding of crypto generally how it works how it operates who it's potentially suitable for as an investment or otherwise etc i'm not sure we really get it at times and who they're regulating because you know 
we are a, a global community and if someone if you were investing with somebody over in a foreign country you might not even know where they are I mean how are you ever going to get your money back mm. Um, so I'll just pick up a, a couple of the comments and then um, I'll bring it to a close. So um, Stephen picked up on your point, Philippa, about um, the advisor acquisitions that's happening and the consolidators and then something potentially going amiss there. Um, and he was like, I very much understand the point um, that he said vertically integrated firms have been doing this for years. So you've got the independent or the financial plan of practice versus the vertically integrated model. And there seems to be very little appetite by the FCA to look into this. So he questions whether they will do this into the future. So we'll see. Good maybe question. they're watching this back and maybe they will. <laughs> and then, Mike, I'll just um, briefly come to you just to wrap up. So just on the consumer duty point, um, Matthew asked around, do we know yet how the FCA will check for progress on consumer duty? Because if it's another survey or whatever, maybe that's not that useful. And also, we've also talked about the lack of resource that there is within the regulator. So is that are those checks even possible? I, th I think this will, I think there's kind of you hit the nail on the head there around the, the real impact of consumer duty will come through on the potential enforcement and how hard that that hits in kind of in 12 months time once it's been implemented. The mm. progress for implementation, it, it'll go through the, the normal channels. So the larger firms and I, I saw a someone I know at a large provider last week who was saying that they've got a big project in place, project team implementing all of this. They'll be directly supervised, so they'll be getting regular progress checks every month, probably, mm -hmm. through through those meetings. A smaller firm such as Dennis's won't. So mm -hmm. it'll be, um, yeah, some quality time with a 150-page consultation paper awaits him, I'm afraid, to, to work out <laughs> what needs to be done on that one. Mm, okay. On that positive note, <laughs> then I think we'll leave it. Thank you so much to everyone uh, for joining in, for all your questions. Again, this is another one that can probably just run and run. Um, uh, but so really appreciate you getting involved. Thank you so much to um, my very, very um, eloquent and articulate panel, <laughs> to, to Dennis, to Mike, to Michael and to Philippa. It's always lovely to chat to you guys. Um, we'll be back in another month's time, same time, same place. But in the meantime, thanks so much for watching and see you again soon. Thank you. All right.